Alright, well, I am happy to introduce you all to our guest speaker this morning. Um, this is Lee Leach. He is Shelly Dizzuti's brother. And he's from, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Chapog Valley. Did I get that right? Chapog Valley Baptist uh, Bible Church in Southbury, Connecticut. And um, he is an elder uh, at his church. And uh, he and his wife, Linda, have four children and 15 grandchildren. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> so you got me beat. So let's all welcome Lee. We appreciate it. Good morning. All right, it's an honor to be here. I brought this Bible. It's not one that I preach from. Usually it's in uh, King James. I was in a King James only church for years. But I just brought this Bible because it says right here, presented to Lee F. Leach by Shelley A. Leach, 421-1996. So um, I first heard about Christ and salvation from my oldest sister when I was 13. And it was interesting to me. I ma actually made a profession of faith, but it wasn't really um, genuine at the time. I think the Lord was calling me, but it was just I wasn't really responding, so I went back to the world, if you will. A few years later, I'm working at a gas station in Connecticut. We had to pump gas back then. You had to have someone pump it for you. I know in Jersey, I, did they change that law, or is it still like that? All right, in Connecticut, we pump our own gas. That's the way it works. But back then, I was a gas jockey. So it was good. I liked it. And one day, I was pumping gas, and this guy comes in. I'm talking to him. He's a very friendly guy, and I'm finished pumping his gas. And at the end, he hands me his pamphlet and says, I'm a pastor at a church, meet in a school nearby. Maybe sometime you get a chance to stop out. OK. So I said, wow, that was really nice. He didn't pressure me with religion or anything like that. I said, I'll, I'll go visit, right? That's how easy it is, folks. It's really not that hard. Maybe sometime you get a chance to step out. Put God's word in somebody's hand. It's really, really easy. So I responded. I went, and I went for a while. And I was, like I said, I was in my late teens and off and on for a couple of years. And I decided, you know, I should really be taking my little sister. I wanted my mom to come. She wanted to be my part of it. So, so my little sister came with us. And I remember they gave the invitation. You know, every head bowed, every eyes closed. And no one looking around, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, I heard this little voice say, Lee, let's go up. That is still one of my greatest um, joys in this, in this faith, to, to remember that. Now, I know that as the years went on, you know, we all, Shelly and I, just kind of wandered, but eventually, God got a hold of us. He never gives up. It wasn't until I was 30 that I finally surrendered my life and... Um, started serving the Lord. But he is incredible. He's an awesome God. Amen? Amen? Amen. I heard that. Um, Shelly sent, I, I actually, this sermon I actually preached um, 2019, and it's a good sermon. When I first, first heard that it, uh, you guys wanted me to come preach here, I said, well, you know what? That's a really good one. I want to preach that. And I'm very busy in my work and everything and that kind of thing, so at the, I went to get the sermon just before I was coming up here. And I realized that for some reason my computer had only saved half the sermon. How does that happen? I don't know, but it happened. So last night I'm, I'm finishing it up, and Shelly texted me. She said, I, I just meant to remind you, church gets over at 12, you got 45 minutes. So I was like, ha! I'm no good for time. So, you know, you're going to have to do a Simon Cowell and wave me in the end there that, with, you know, we're just getting over, pal, because. I'm, I'll yeah. I can talk loud. So I stop talking when God stops talking, right? Amen? So let, let's pray. Father, um, Lord, it is, it is an incredible honor to be here. Um, Lord, I just, we just love you so much for all that you do for us, the way you use us, in spite of our failings, in spite of our weaknesses. Lord, you're just such an amazing God. So, Father, this morning, no one really needs to hear from me. We need to hear from you, Father. So I pray, Lord, that I would just get out of the way, that your words would be on my lips, and that you would speak to our hearts. And all of this would bring honor and glory to your holy name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Uh, take your Bibles, please, and open them to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, Jacob la lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Je Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bil Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, I'm going to do a lot of reading as we go through this chapter. We're actually going to go through Genesis chapter 37 uh, all the way through the end uh, 45, 40, I think we're going to go to. But I'm not going to read it all, don't worry. But I am going to give summations of that because it's for time, we just don't have time to it. But... Uh, so I'm going to sum up some of it. In the following verses, Joseph tells his family about a couple of dreams where he had visions of him achieving a place of prominence and everyone will be bowing down to him. And as you can imagine, this information was not well received by the family. Okay? Would it be well received by you if somebody told you they were going to eventually bow down to you, especially their kid brother? No, that's not well received. Uh, just, for, just as an aside, how many people in here have heard this story about Joseph and have heard sermons preached on it? Mostly everybody. Anybody here not know this story? Don't be shy. So everybody knows the story, right? Okay. A lot of sermons. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from Joseph's life. No question about it. A friend of mine said to me one time, you can never go wrong preaching on Joseph. So Genesis chapter 37, we're going to pick up in verse 10. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow yourself to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But he, his father kept the saying in mind. In the next few verses, Joseph's brothers were out pasturing the fields and the flock. If you know the story. And, and his father sends, him, sends Joseph out to go and spy on his brothers. Now, of course, this begs the question, Joseph is 17, right? So the brothers are out there working and Joseph's home. Why is Joseph home? Why? Because he's the favorite, and he's spoiled. Another reason they don't like this guy, okay? So he goes out to spy on him, and he's a tattletale, right? So let's pick up in verse 18. And they saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him, to kill him. That's how much they hated him. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we would say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what would become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands, restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. So, you've heard all this. At this point, you all assume that I'm going to preach this great sermon on Joseph. And if you assume that, you'd be wrong. This sermon is not about Joseph. I like to surprise my congregation at home oftentimes, so I would like a surprise for you. We're going to preach today about another of the brothers. Because this story is not just about Joseph, it's about the entire family and the dynamic of the family. And the Bible devotes some cha a whole chapter to another brother, and it also devotes other verses to other brothers, right? So we're going to talk about Judah. What about Judah? All of verse 38, is, or chapter 38, is devoted to Judah, right? So we're going to start learning about him and what kind of person he is, starting in verse 26. So then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. And then Midian, Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Okay, so what do we see about Joseph or Judah in these verses, right? He's a leader, right? 
He's the fourth brother, yet he speaks up. So he's bold enough to speak up. He's got an idea, and they listen to him. His older brothers listen to him. What a great idea. We'll make a few shekels here. We can all split it. Right? They sold him for 20 shekels, I believe. Benjamin wasn't in the picture. Joseph wasn't included. So now that's 10, she- 10 shekels or t- uh, two shekels apiece. Not bad. Let's do this. Great idea. He's clever. Maybe a little greedy. Right? Thinking about money, not thinking about his brother. Right? Comes up with this clever pan- plan. What else? He's self-centered. Pretty obvious. He lacks compassion. He gives absolutely no thought to his kid brother who's being bullied by all these people. Ten against one. Throw him in the pit. Strip his clothes off of him. No compassion at all. None. Throw him in the pit. Let's sell him. Right? You're going to sell him for, as a slave. You might as well kill him. Right? No compassion at all. What a guy. He says he wants to sell him, right, instead of killing him. Why? Make money? Yeah. But also because, you know what? Maybe he's thinking, I don't want the blood on my hands. And he says that. Let, let not his blood be on our, our hands. Well, come on, let's face facts here. When people that are self-centered are saying, Let's not somebody's, let not his blood be on our hands, they're really saying, let not, not his blood be on my hands. All right, so that's Judah. Nice guy. Either way, they're going to be rid of Joseph. Right? Problem solved. When you read these chapters, and you know, so many of us think we come from dysfun- dysfunctional families. Imagine being part of this group. What else do we see about Judah? In verses 29 to the end of the chapter, we see that all of them are seeing the results of their selfish behavior. Right? Genesis chapter 37, 29 to 35, we're going to read. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? All about me. I don't care about him. What am I going to do? I've got to go face Dad, Reuben. He's a little selfish too. Right? So then they took the jo- Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. Whose idea was that? We don't, the Bible doesn't tell us. But, and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father. We know that jo- Judah went along with this, right? This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. Great idea because they don't have the body to go search for. Right? If they just said he disappeared, they'd have to go hunt for this body. So like, no, no, he's all torn to pieces. Sorry, Dad. He's dead. Then Jacob tore his garments and put a sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Okay, I'm not going to add to the Bible here, but these are human beings. So if we put ourselves in that context, right? You've done some things, right? And you see this, the reaction from the father, who's the patriarch of the family, a very brave man, right? And what happens? He's crying, he refuses to be comforted, he's brokenhearted. You got to start to wonder if maybe these people, if they have some little bit of compassion in them saying, maybe we went a little too far here. Maybe. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but you look at what Joseph or Judah did from that point on. So what did he do? Well, the Holy Spirit devotes all of chapter 38 to Judah. So what did he do? What's his reaction? Right? It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. And he, she conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onam. Yet again, she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezib when she bore him. Verse 1, he leaves his family and the entire culture and goes and lives with who? The Canaanites. Sworn enemies of Israel, vile wicked people, child sacrifice, all kinds of things. They're wicked people, enemies of God. What does he do? 
he goes and he lives with these people. Makes friends with them. His best friend, and the Dulamite, a rebellious person. What is it? That's what he, that was his reaction to going back to see his dad, seeing his broken-hearted dad, maybe, and again, I'm not trying to add to the Bible, I'm just wondering in this context, why did he go and live with these people? Why did he make that choice? He's selfish. We've already determined that, right? But you know what? Maybe he didn't want to be around anymore. How are you going to live a lie? Living a lie is really virtually impossible if you are part of the family of God. It is. You can't do it. Unconfessed sin, it just eats you alive. Okay? So what did he do? He packs it up. I'm going to go hang out with the Canaanites. I'm going to make a friend. I've got buddies. You know what? I'm going to marry into this culture. He marries into the culture. It's in direct violation of the teachings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their family. You don't marry these people. But he did it anyway. Complete and total disrespect. That's Judah. Judah thought, as many of us do when we do sinful things and selfish things, that getting rid of Joseph would make him happy. Well, that, when that didn't work, he abandons his family and the people of God and goes and joins himself to the world. As we are going to see, as we move on, that plan never works out. If you belong to God, God will only let you wander so far and so long. Just far enough to see that the only thing this world has to offer for us is pain and suffering in the end. So what happens to Judah? Chapter 38, 6, six through 11. And Judah took a wife from Ur, his first, her, his, for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord put him to death. And then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offer, offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. <coughs> then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went, it, went and remained in her father's house. Okay, so Judah raises sons, right, in a wicked culture. And what happens? He winds up with wicked sons. What a surprise. Imagine that. They were so wicked that God ended their life. He does that sometimes. The Bible shows that. Not always. Just because someone dies, we don't just assume it's because they're wicked. But God does take the life of some people if they're wicked enough. It's God's choice. He's God. We're not. And he always does what's right. How does this affect Judah? It had to have had some effect. He's human. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it does show us results of this. But the reality is it doesn't really talk about how Judah reacted to the death of his child. But we saw how Jacob re responded. The death of a child, okay, is some of the most difficult things that anyone can go through in life. They carry that scar with them their entire life. Years ago, Linda and I were good friends with a, a, a couple. I was the best man in their wedding, in fact. And their son developed a <coughs> rare disease. And from age 6 to age 13, he digressed and he died. And we had to be with her as a friend all along. We were praying with her, encouraging her, right? And unfortunately, what happens is when, this, when people get sick or a child gets sick or whatever, a loved one, you will have well-meaning Christians who will tell you, if you have enough faith, God will answer your prayer and heal you, heal your child or heal you, right? You hear this. She used she, People are desperate. She used to watch Benny Hinn all the time. And of course, I got to be a wet blanket and tell her no. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay, God is able to do these things. And he will, at times, hear us and respond to our prayers. But if not, we're still going to trust him. That's faith. Faith is not, I believe God's going to give me what I want. And the reason I hate this, and I preach on this in my church a lot, Okay, and I believe God hates this too, because it hurts people. It destroys their faith, it crushes them when their prayers are not answered 
and the people would have the unmitigated gall to look at somebody who's had a tremendous loss in their life and tell them it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. It infuriates me. It's so wrong because it's not faith. Okay? So we have to trust him. And God can make, you know, if you've had experience a loss like that, my heart breaks for you. My heart broke then. I held that woman. I went over there when, her, when, the, when they said that the, the, the boy had died. My wife let me know. And I went over there. And I held her, and she cried. I have never heard anyone cry like that. Never. From the depths of her soul, she cried. That's, that's hurt. That's a scar that you, man, so, it crushes people. What happened to her? What did she do with God? Because she did have incredible faith even though sometimes it was misguided. And what happened in the years to come, she spent 15, 20 years maybe, and um, she fostered children, crack babies. God took that suffering in her life and used it to bless so many little babies. God can use our pain. Now, the, she healed eventually. She wanted to put a, her daughter gave her a beautiful grandchild, and her life got better, okay? But the scar is going to always be there. But God, no matter what we go through in life, no matter what suffering you may be going through right now or anyone else goes through, God can and will heal that, heal that suffering, heal that pain, and use it, and use you. So don't ever give up. But don't ever let anybody, don't ever let anybody tell you that suffering that comes into your life or someone else's life is because they didn't have enough faith. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. Now, it doesn't say here that God took her because she was wicked. It just says she died. People die. We have sickness in this world. Sometimes we die from life's wrong life choices. Things happen. But she died. So now Judah's now suffered the loss of two children and his wife, too. Tell me this didn't affect this guy. It had to have an effect on him. The Bible says, when Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. Let's read on. Chapter 38, verse 13 to 26. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. And he turned to the roadside and said, come, let me come in to you. Okay, she didn't know, he didn't know she was his daughter-in-law. She's deceiving him because he didn't do the right thing. She was not, Sheila was not grown enough that they could get married. And she was supposed to, he was supposed to have given her to him in marriage. Right? A widow in that culture, they're destitute. She's living in her father's home, but once he dies, what's she going to do? Beg? This was wrong, what he did. And she knew it, and he knew it. But he did it anyway. So she deceives him. He goes into her. She becomes pregnant. She says here, I, he says, she says, what pledge will you give me? And he says, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it, what pledge shall I give you? Right, he asked. And she replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. And then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Right? When Judah sent the young goat back by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at the name in the road, roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah, uh, to, he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. And also the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, well, let her keep those things as her own, or we shall, be, we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immor immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. And as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, that the signet and the cord and the staff 
right? Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, so did I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her again. Did you catch that? Don't miss that. Verse 26, right? She is more righteous than I. You're seeing a change in this guy. It's, uh, right? It's not super obvious, but it's there. This is a guy who didn't care about anybody at all. His whole family. Heck with him. I'm going to make money and get rich. This is great. Okay? And the fact of the matter is, now here we are, years later, right? And something happens, and he owns up to it. He takes responsibility. That's maturity. That's when you see people changing. He takes responsibility. It's not her fault. It's mine. They could have stoned her to death. But they didn't, because he owned up to it. Not only that, okay, but he had already been with her. She's having children by him. Her husbands are dead. Eh, he could marry her, right? He doesn't. Why? Because that'd be wicked and vile. This is your daughter-in-law. How disgusting. But he chooses not to do that. He does the right thing. See the change? Okay, as we read on in chapters 42 and 44, so we're not going to read that, but I'll just sum it up for you. We see that the famine arises, right? And Israel's sons go down to Egypt to buy grain, and guess who's with them? Judah. He's back with his family. How'd that happen? <coughs> right? Joseph's now prime minister in Egypt. They have to go down and buy grain. They're all going to starve to death. And there's Judah, right with the family again. Judah's gone through some tremendous hardships. He's made some really bad choices in life, and now he's suffered for it. Okay? And what's he do? He goes back to the family. If you go through, so many people in this life, they go through hardships in life. They blame God. All right? And they turn from church. I'm done with my church family. I'm not going to church anymore. I don't want anything to my family. I'm out of here. They even go away from their family. When you get people that have been involved in drugs and that kind of thing, they distance themselves from the family. That happens all the time. That's the worst thing we can do, and it's satanic, because he's trying to get you separate. You know, as a, as a roaring lion, right? Separate you from the herd. And when people go through suffering and that kind of thing, they go away from the family of God. I'm not going to church anymore. I don't want to deal with this. I just can't. And they Go off into the world, and what does the world have to offer you? Just more pain and suffering. When you struggle, all of us, everyone in this room is going to go through some kind of suffering in this life. That's just the way it is. This world is a lost and dying world, and we're going to suffer. And when we do, right, the best thing we can do is draw near to the people, get closer to the people who love you and love God. You come to church, people love on you. Pray for you. You need this. We need this. We have to do this. And Judah made the choice to go back and be with his family. Time doesn't allow us to read all the account of Joseph and his brother, so I'll, I will give you, continue to give you a summation, right? But I encourage you to go home. Go back home. I know you're familiar with these passages. But go read them again, because this is a living, breathing book, and God speaks to you in many different ways. God has spoken to me over the years. I've been a Christian for over 30 years, and God has spoken to me numerous times through this book in different ways. Every day when I meet with him, when I pray to him, he speaks to me, and there's times I read a passage, and I've read it a thousand times and heard sermons preached, and all of a sudden something jumps out of me that I had never seen before. So I encourage you, go, go back home, ask God, what, what do you want to tell me from these pastors of the world? And he'll, you'd be surprised, it's amazing. All right? He'll give you a fresh insight. So the brothers go to Egypt, as I said, where Joseph is now prime minister. They don't recognize him. Right? So he puts them through this myriad of tests. Now, some people say, well, was he being vindictive to his brothers? I don't think so, because if you look at the end result, I think Joseph was just kind of testing them to see if they were still as bad as they were. You know? That's just kind of my thoughts on it. Right? And they make, they make a mistake, and then they tell him that they have another brother, Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. Well, Joseph, as we know, makes, makes them bring him back. 
Now, Je Israel doesn't want to let him go because he's afraid that he's, something's going to happen to him as well because those two boys, Joseph and uh, Benjamin, are the children of his relationship to his favorite wife, Rachel. Okay? So he doesn't want to lose Benjamin, so he doesn't want him to go. But Joseph, through all the things that he does, makes him come back. He's going to have to come. Sorry. They bring him back. And they, you know, as we know, he, he, he puts his has his uh, servant put the cup in Benjamin's bag. He sends the troops out to get him, bring him back, and they're going to arrest Benjamin. Right? So, they're going to arrest Benjamin. And people, obviously, the, the guys are nervous about it. So if we pick up, pick up in chapter 44, and I'll give you a chance to get there. And we're going to pick up in verse 30. Now, therefore, now this is Judah speaking, and he's talking, to ben, he's talking to Joseph, and he's pleading with him to not arrest Benjamin. Okay? And he, and he reminds him that they had said that the father didn't want Benjamin to come down here, and now he's here. And Judah had to really beg him, and all the other brothers did, the other brothers too, to say let, to let him go, and you know Israel wasn't keen on it, but eventually it happened. And now, what's going to happen? He's going to wind up doing. What's going to happen is exactly what Israel feared. He's going to wind up a slave in Egypt. He's going to be in an Egyptian prison, and he's never going to see him again. And he might as well be dead to him, right? And Judas pleading with Joseph, and he says, "Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father." and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see that the evil that would find my father. Wow. That's a different guy. Right? That's a completely different person, right, than you saw 20 years earlier. 20 years ago, he couldn't care less about his brother. And he didn't care about his father. He didn't give him a second thought to the fact that, come on, think about it. You're a human being. You're going you're gonna to go back and tell your father that your brother is dead? He didn't even, he couldn't care less. I made 20, you know, we made 20 shekels. We're doing good, right? So what does he do? But now here, 20 years later, he's worried about breaking his father's heart. He's worried about his father dying. How am I going to tell him that this kid is in jail now? And what happened, what you were so afraid of, absolutely happened. How am I going to face this guy? Please, don't do this. All right? Tell you what, take me instead. Take me instead. I'll be a slave. I'll be in prison. This guy's going to sacrifice his life for his brother. What's the Bible say? Greater love has no man than this that he laid on his life for his friends, right? All of a sudden, this Judah has this incredible love in him for, this, for his brother and for his father. And he's willing to sacrifice his own life. That's a different guy. What did it? How did it happen? Suffering. None of us wants to suffer in this life. Okay? But we're going to. And there's an old expression that, you know what? Suffering can make you bitter or better, Right? How many times have you heard that? So, but it's not us that does it, because in our flesh, when we go through a suffering, we inst we're, we're just self-focused, and we become bitter. What's going to make us better? God. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. If we let him, if we draw close to him, if we seek his face, if we turn to him when we're suffering, that's the only thing that's going to do it. What's the end result of Judah's journey? In chapter 45, right, right after that, 
he, he gives this impassioned plea, offers to sacrifice his life. And you've got to remember, Joseph remembers seeing Judah above him in the pit, coming up with this great idea of selling him into slavery and putting him for the 13 years of suffering that he had to go through. Of all the brothers, I've got to wonder if maybe he didn't hate him the most. But he didn't hate. Joseph didn't hate. He loved. Because his suffering as he went through his time frame, God used it to change it and mold it and shape him. Right? So, when he hears his impassioned plea, he breaks down and starts crying. And, and what happens? The end result is, not right all immediately, but the reconciliation between the brothers and Joseph starts happening. That's how God uses these circumstances in us. As we read to the end of the book of Genesis, we see that because of Reuben's sin, right, he loses the birthright. Reuben committed a wicked, vile sin with his stepmother. He lost his birthright. He's the oldest. So the birthright should, should automatically have gone to the next ones down the line, Simeon and Levi. But if you read in the account that Simeon and Levi were both violent men and slaughtered an entire town of men because of what, they had done to, uh, what one of them had done to their, their sister. Now, they were justifiably angry, but that doesn't give you the right to be violent to people, right? And they did, and they brought shame to the family, and they could have co cost them all their lives, so they lost the birthright too. So the birthright fell to, number four, Judah. Now, God knew that the birthright was going to Judah. So this is a, an important tremendously important responsibility, so it needed to shape Judah, God needed to shape Judah, to make him ready for that. You know, oftentimes we're going to go through suffering in life because God has something great for us to do. We have to trust that. In Matthew chapter 1, we read the book genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron. And then jumping down to verse um, 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of, Mary, husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. Judah, Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather, and the lineage of the Savior of the world, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. We all know Romans 8, 28, 29, and we know, and we know for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Folks, when we go through life, we go through trials in this life, right? If we draw near to God and trust him, right? He will do a great work in our life. He really will. None of us wants to suffer. There's a whole movement going on in the Christian church all around this world now, all about love. God is all love. We never talk about the God of judgment. We just talk about the God of love. He is a God of love. I'm, I'm not at all minimizing that. Okay? But he also judges sin. And we're going to suffer. The, the name it and claim it people will tell you that you're not going to suffer. You're going to become a Christian. Your life is going to be great. You're going to get everything you want. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right? It's going to be great. It's not great. How many... How many people in here, since you became a Christian, have had just a perfect, great life? I don't see any hands. Okay? It's not like that. But God will use these sufferings to conform us to the image of Christ. He has to do that. We learn more from the trials in our lives than we do from the blessings. That's just the way it is. But we trust him because his end result, right? It's not just a matter of just making us suffer because we're bad people and always going to hurt us. That's not what it's about at all. He, brings the he allows the suffering in our lives to shape us. He uses the suffering 
to make us more like Christ, because that's the end result. And for Judah, he went through some horrible suffering. I don't deny that. But the end result was God was able to use it to mold him and shape him into a better person. And throughout all of eternity, here we are 2,000 years later, some schlep like me is standing up in front of you talking about Judah, his name, throughout all of eternity, right? Will forever be linked with the, with the Lord of Lords, right? King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, forever. Think about that. And if you are here this morning, and you have trusted in Christ as Savior, you've repented of your sins, right? The Bible tells us that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So whenever that book, they pick it up, Lamb's Book of Life, Jesus Christ, it's his book. You open it up. Shelley A. Leach, Lee F. Leach. Forever. Your name is linked with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the God of the universe. Forever. Think about that. Dwell on that. Meditate on that. You are part of the kingdom of God. And if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, right? you've never repented of your sins, I encourage you to do that today. Don't put it off another minute. This is a God that loves us. In this world, there's going to be suffering. You're going to suffer whether you're saved or not. But the suffering that the world offers us this brings us nothing but pain. And there is, the end result is just death. The suffering that we go through, as we go through this suffering, God can use it. But the end result is we're going to spend eternity with the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there will be no more pain and no more tears and no more suffering. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are an amazing God. And you love us so much. Father, none of us wants to suffer. We don't want that. Father, even, even the Lord Jesus Christ, when he knew he was going to suffer on the cross, asked that the cup be removed from him. But he knew that he had to do it. He knew that he had to, had to go there for us. And we just praise you for that. Lord, we'll love him throughout all eternity that he was willing to go through that suffering for us. But Lord, we know that joy comes in the morning. So we just praise you for that. Father, as we go out this week, God, I just pray that we could just share the love of Christ with everyone we see, everyone we meet, Lord, and just praise him and bless him. And the world will know that there's a difference in our lives, Father. And we just give you the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we, we, uh, we close our service at church, at my church, with uh, a benediction. So the benediction for today is from Romans chapter 8. Verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you very much.